Hello, everyone. Uh, super excited to be here. Um, like Rachel said, I'm very proud Cooper EM grad who's now at Jefferson in Philly. Um, so I actually work at our, um, our Center City location, which is a large academic center, as well as Methodist Hospital, which is a smaller community site um, in South Philly. So shout out to the Jeff residents. They should be on virtual. Unclear, but um, it was funny when I was very honored, obviously, to be asked to do this major imposter syndrome being here. And my one stipulation, I texted Byrne and I was like, I hope I don't go right after you. So here we are, but um, really excited to be here. So I'm going to talk to you about headache zebras. So I think we've all heard the saying, um, when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. And that's supposed to remind us to consider um, the most common diagnoses first, right? Especially with a chief complaint as common as headache. The problem with that is every so often those hoofbeats actually might belong to a zebra. So you have to at least know what the zebras are to look out for them, because if one comes galloping into your ED and you're just thinking horses, you're going to miss it. So today I'm really just going to go through three cases that represent um, three rare headache syndromes. And my objective is just to have you be able to recognize the rare headache syndromes and then feel comfortable with just basic diagnosis and management strategies from the ED. So let's get started. So your first case, you have a female in her early 30s. She's coming in with a pretty severe headache and some sort of visual disturbance. So you go to see her and she's like, yeah, you know, I've had a bad headache um, since I had a baby a few days ago. But this morning I went to make my breakfast and the headache just got really severe. Like it came out of nowhere. I had to like literally put my cereal down and I felt like I couldn't see, like my vision was really blurry. Um, and now I feel like I'm having double vision. So it's making me really nauseous and I just don't really want to open my eyes. And she doesn't look like the best, right? She looks like someone that has a pretty bad headache. And someone's probably whispering like, what's the blood pressure? <laughs> Which is perfect, right? Because uh, obviously anyone who's pregnant or postpartum with a headache is preeclamptic until proven otherwise. But unfortunately, preeclampsia is far too common, definitely not a zebra. Um, so her blood pressure taken twice is normal. All of her vitals are normal. Um, so you're kind of examining her. She has like a non-focal neuro exam, um, but she's got like decreased visual acuity bilaterally. Um, and she's just having this really bad double vision. So you're like, okay, let me think about, you know, differential here. Obviously, any sudden headache, you're thinking subarachnoid or some sort of hemorrhage, right? Um, you're thinking, okay, is this like a complex migraine? Is this an ocular migraine? Something like that. You're thinking less common, but possible young female with some sort of, um, you know, ocular complaint. Could this be like MS, optic neuritis, maybe less likely. Um, you're thinking about ocular pathologies. Like, could this be a retinal detachment or glaucoma, something like that? Probably less likely in her because it seems bilateral, but you're thinking about all this, right? And either way, you're like, I know what I'm going to do for this patient, at least initially, right? You're going to get a head CT. Um, to make sure there's no bleed, and you're going to give her, you know, a migraine cocktail, something like that. So you put in those orders, and you go to see another patient, or five, depending on the day, right? Um, and so she goes to CT, and when she gets back from CT, the nurse comes to get you, and she's like, this patient doesn't look good. So you go back in the room, and now the patient looks really toxic. Like, this doesn't look like a migraine anymore. So now she's not just nauseous, she's vomiting. Um, she's like writhing in pain. She's like, I have this horrible abdominal pain. And you're like mashing on her stomach and she has nothing focal. She's not peritoneal. So you're like, this is weird. Like, does she have a kidney stone and a subarachnoid? And she's just like the most unlucky postpartum woman in the planet. Um, and then you look at the monitor and she's bradycardic and you cycle a pressure and she's hypotensive. So you're like, oh, my God, what is going on? You kind of start to spiral, right? Um, so you tell the nurse to hang some fluids, and then radiology calls. And you're like, great. You're like, does she have a subarachnoid? Um, and they're like, no, no, I'm not seeing any hemorrhage. Um, but the area in her pituitary looks a little sus. You're like, okay, like, you want to expand on that a little? And they're like, I, I don't know. Like, there's some nonspecific stuff going on. Um, I'd recommend an MRI. So you're like, okay, great. And the final read comes in as something like, you know, no acute intracranial hemorrhage, um, nonspecific findings in the area of the pituitary, uh, recommend MRI for further characterization, correlate clinically. And you're like, well, I'm trying to correlate clinically. I, I don't know what's going on with her, right? But then you start thinking and you're like, oh, thinking back to med school and you're like, something going on with her pituitary and her hormones. 
and this sudden headache. Anyone have any idea what this might be? Literally can't hear that, but I'm, what'd you say? Yeah, yeah. So Sheehan syndrome or um, uh, pituitary apoplexy. So total zebra, right? Has anyone diagnosed anyone in the ED with this? No, maybe one in the back. Um, so pituitary apoplexy occurs when there's um, a sudden hemorrhage or infarction of the pituitary gland. Um, pregnancy, if you didn't know this, is a disease. Um, so it puts you at risk for many things, um, to say the least. So um, during pregnancy, your pituitary gland actually enlargens just as part of the physiologic process. So that in and of itself puts you at an increased risk. And then any sort of postpartum hemorrhage, whether it's from a vaginal delivery C-section, that also puts you at risk of um, spontaneous like pituitary necrosis. So if you have a patient that is postpartum that had a hemorrhage with spontaneous pituitary, pituitary necrosis that has pituitary apoplexy, that term is called, um, like that syndrome is Sheehan syndrome. So you might remember that from like step one, very board testable. Um, this is hard to diagnose, right? And we're, we're often probably not making it in the ED, but it's possible. 75% um, of patients have some sort of significant visual deficit. Um, and it's normally not just like, you know, 20 out of 40, like mild um, decreased visual acuity. It's normally like a very distinct diplopia or even a hemianopia where like they can't see out of the left side of both of their eyes. So it's really important that you do don't just do like visual acuity. You do visual field testing. You check an ocular pressure, things like that on these patients. And you're going to get a CT in everyone here, right? Not because you're like, you're not putting in the indication, like, please look at the pituitary. Um, but you're going to get it because you want to rule out a mass or a hemorrhage, things like that. A lot of the times, they will see um, some nonspecific changes in the area of the pituitary. So that might tip you off if the clinical picture fits. Um, but even with a normal head CT, you still need to get an MRI to confirm the diagnosis. Um, and then these patients, you're going to give them IV steroids, so hydrocortisone. Um, and that's to prevent or reduce um, the adrenal crisis or insufficiency. So almost all patients that have a sudden pituitary hemorrhage or infarction, their pituitary just stops secreting ACTH. So their cortisol level just drops really suddenly, and that precipitates an adrenal crisis. So in this patient, that was why she decompensated. She was vomiting. Um, patients might have really bad abdominal pain, but a non-focal exam um, and then the bradycardia hypotension, that all kind of fits in that syndrome. And then beyond steroids, this is really important that they are basically at a large academic center that can um, coordinate multidisciplinary care. So neurosurgery needs to be involved early um, because depending on the degree of that the hemorrhage has um, like mass effect on the optic nerve, they might want to pursue surgical decompression. And then they'll often want to involve ENT because if they do a transphenoidal approach, they'll need ENT for that. Then they'll want endocrine involved for hormone replacement recommendations. They'll want opto involved. And then if the patient's postpartum, MFM will often be the primary team on the patient. So all that to say, you don't necessarily need to call all those consults in the ED. But if you're at a small community site, you want to get this patient transferred so they can get that multidisciplinary care. Oh, that happened. I swear I pressed it once. Oh, no, don't look at the rest. Okay. It's like, it's going to give it away. I only have three cases. Okay, I'm pressing it very lightly. Okay, so takeaways, if you have someone um, that is either postpartum, other things, if someone has a known pituitary adenoma, that can put them at an increased risk for this or anyone on blood thinners or recent surgery or trauma. Um, try to think about this. And when in doubt, give some IV hydrocortisone and see if they get better. Okay, case two. So you're kind of stalking the waiting room and you see a 42-year-old female check in. And her chief complaint is entered as thunderclap headache. And then her vitals go in and her vitals are stone cold normal. And then she's triaged as an ESI 4. So what's the first thing you do? You roll your eyes, right? You scoff. You're like, who's in triage today? You're like, why couldn't they just write headache? Like, who's writing thunderclap headache as the chief complaint? Um, and then you're like, all right, let me actually like chart review this person. So your CABCs, as Dr. Byrne might say, right? So you're chart reviewing and you're like, okay, that's interesting. This, she's been here multiple times for this. So she was here a few weeks ago. Um, the documentation was a little sparse. You know who you are if you're the sparse documenter. Um, so it's hard to tell, but it wasn't documented as a, you know, worst headache of her life. Um, some sort of migraine type of thing. She got a migraine cocktail, got better, went home. 
And then two weeks ago, she came back, documented worst headache of her life. She said it happened around 8 a.m., like before she went to work. And then by like 8.15, it was, it was done. So she thought, okay, well, I don't really want to take off work. I don't want to use my PTO. So she went to work from 9 to 5. But then she came to the ED because she was like, this is literally the worst headache I've ever had in my life. Like, I felt like something had to be wrong. So I wanted to come in and get checked out. So on that visit, she had the whole gamut, right? She had labs. She had a CT. She had an LP that was a champagne tap, of course, right? Um, all totally normal. She got a migraine cocktail again. She didn't have a headache when she was in the ED, but she felt better and she went home. So now she's back. And at this point, you're like, okay, two buckets. Like this person is either like cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs or they like need an MRI and something's actually going on, right? So you go in and you're talking to her and she's like, yeah, this is like the fourth or fifth time that this has happened. She's like, I swear, like, I don't like coming to hospitals. It happened earlier this week and I didn't come back to the ED because I was like, I was just there and I had a normal workup. So like, why would I go back? And she's like, same thing happened today. She's like, I got ready for work and I had the worst headache I've ever had. It felt the same as my other ones. I like couldn't do anything, totally debilitated. Um, and then it just went away. And she has no focal neuro deficit. Again, her vitals are normal. She looks great. She doesn't have a headache right now. So if you're trying to think, you're like, I mean, it sounds like she had a subarachnoid like eight hours ago, right? And you're like, well, on the one hand, like I could really use some more LPs to graduate, right? But you're like, it's also like 2.15 and I'm about to sign out and I don't really want to do an LP and I don't think she needs an LP, right? But you're like, I also don't want to present to the attending that she doesn't need an LP because then they're going to think that I don't want to do the LP. So you're basically just spiraling, right? And um, Dr. Byrne sees you and he's like, just, you know, just present this patient to me. Like, what's going on? So you tell him about the patient and he's like, oh, this sounds like, like, have you heard of RCVS? And you're like, RCVS? Like, we have a CVS in the hospital now? And he's like, ha ha, bad dad joke, right? Um, and he's like, no, I mean, RCVS, like reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. And you're like, no, I've actually literally never heard of that. Like, did you just make that up? So you're like, all right, you know, I'm going to go read about it or whatever. And then you're like, but it's also like 2.30. So can we just clarify, like, we're not doing the, we're not doing the LP? Okay, I'm, I'm just going to go read about it. Um, so RCVS, really interesting. Um, it's a condition that basically causes recurrent thunderclap headaches. Um, it's caused by um, segmental vasoconstriction of the cerebral arteries, um, more common in women, peaks in the early 40s normally. And people will come in saying that they had the worst headache of their life. It usually completely resolves within 15 minutes to an hour, and then they look totally fine. Now, this is not something that you're going to diagnose on like the first time they're in the ED, the second, the third time, right? But it's something that if you take a good enough history and you do a good enough chart review, it might start to kind of tick off alarm bells. Um, you're going to get a CT for these people. Usually they'll have a CT or an LP kind of in their repertoire, but you really need angiography like a CTA or an MRA to actually diagnose the patient. And they usually do pretty well long term um, on calcium channel blockers. Now, is this someone, if I'm at a community site without access to MRI or neurology, am I transferring them in the middle of the night? No. But I would put in like an urgent referral to neuro. And if you have the ability to order like an MRA as an outpatient, I would do that. Um, like I said, they tend to do pretty well. But over time, increased vasospastic events can actually lead to increased um, ischemic injury and hemorrhage. So it's not something that you want to go undiagnosed and untreated over time. So takeaways, if you have someone that's coming in with recurrent thunderclap headaches, maybe they're not crazy. Maybe they actually have RCVS. All right, last but not least, almost there for anyone falling asleep. So you have a 16-year-old male who's coming in with episodic headaches. And the triage note writes, um, the triage note nurse puts in like question mark, distorted body image. So this is another one that you're kind of like cringing before going in, right? You like chug an apple juice or some like goldfish from the PZD. And you go in and the mom's like, yeah, I don't know what to tell you. Like, Joey's a great kid. He just keeps getting these headaches. And like, I give him Motrin and Tylenol. And I, I don't really know if it's getting better. And he, he like, his weird is just mood. Like, his mood is weird, which is odd for him. He like does well in school. I don't feel like he's skipping out on anything. He doesn't play sports. He hasn't had a concussion. No medical history. So you're like, okay. You ask mom to leave the room. You're talking to Joey. You're like, what's going on? 
And he's like, you're going to think I'm crazy. And, and you're like, did you walk through the same ED that I work in? Because trust me, I'm not going to think you're crazy. Like, lay it on me. So he's like, okay, I get these headaches. And a few minutes into them, my hands get really big. And I feel like I could just smush my little sister like a bug. And you're like, okay, so what I'm hearing you say is you get a headache and you want to hit your sister? And he's like, no, 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 I don't want to do anything to my sister. I love my sister. He's like, my hands literally look like they're the size of a house. And you're like, okay. And you're asking him about other symptoms, nothing. No numbness, weakness. He's able to walk, no visual changes, nothing like that. And then you're like, so I hear school's going well. Like, do you have a good friend group? Like any drug use? Like totally fine. I'm not going to tell your mom. And he's like, no, 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 I don't, I don't do drugs. And you're like, okay, okay, great. And then you're like, whenever you could just give us a urine sample real quick, um, you know, routine, we do it for everyone, right? Um, trust but verify. Um, but the drug screen's totally normal. So you're like, what is going on? So you have this adolescent with recurrent episodic headaches and distorted body image. Any idea what this might be? Yeah, Alice in Wonderland syndrome. Has anyone heard of that, right? Crazy, crazy syndrome. So this is more common in children and adolescents. It's associated with migraines. It's essentially like a type of complex migraine. Um, and it's also associated, though, with like temporal lobe epilepsy, um, Lyme disease, mono, and a few other infectious diseases. So these people usually do pretty well treated as an outpatient. They get started on basically migraine prophylaxis, and it basically their symptoms resolve. Um, and they usually don't even have to be on meds through adulthood. Um, that being said, again, depends on your practice setting. If you're somewhere where you have peds neuro, I would love to consult neuro due to concerns for Alice in Wonderland syndrome. That's like now on my bucket list. Um, but again, am I transferring this patient from Methodist to CHOP at three in the morning? No, of course not. I'm, I'm putting in like a neuro consult and I'm probably going to call the next day and be like, hey, I think this patient might have this rare syndrome. Um, the main thing, though, in the ED setting is you want to reassure the patient that, like, they're not going crazy. Because <laughs> you can imagine being a 16, 18-year-old guy in high school who's, like, feels like he's either getting really big or really small with these headaches. He probably thinks he has schizophrenia or something. Um, so that can take a toll and, like, really affect their quality of life. So just explaining to them in the ED, like, hey, this is a migraine syndrome. Like, basically, it's treatable. Like, you're not going to have these symptoms forever can be really um, reassuring for them. So takeaway, if you have someone with a headache and basically distorted body image, whether they feel like they're really big or really small, um, think about Alice in Wonderland syndrome. So that's pretty much it. Again, thank you so much for having me today. I think the kind of TLDR of this lecture is when you hear hoofbeats, definitely think horses. But if you don't know what the zebras are, you're not going to know if one gallops into your ED. And that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs>